Alpha Phoenix was on location at Pinehurst a few weeks ago with the crazy rolling greens of Thistledew and my mom, who's an infinitely better golfer than myself, to demonstrate how you can approach any everyday topic like a scientist. I can't promise or really even suggest that you'll putt better after watching this video, but hopefully you will find that phase space is an interesting way to think about problems in everyday life. When you putt a golf ball, you really only have control of two variables, the speed of the ball and the direction it goes. If we want to make this putt, we could either take a slow speed and high angle up the hill, or we could go extremely fast and go straight towards the cup. If we plot these out with speed and angle as the variables, you could take a whole bunch of shots and slowly build up a picture of the ideal putt. Not in real space on the green, but in phase space in terms of things that you can control. But I'm not making videos, I'm a grad student, so my actual day job is growing semiconducting crystals in machines like this one. You can think of this as like a really, really precise spray painting machine, where you've got individual atoms being sprayed from below, accumulating in layers on a substrate, building the precise crystal structure that we want to assemble. But that's really beside the point. Just like golf, a system like this has a few variables that you can control but a wide variety of outcomes that you want to be able to control. This is a diagram another student showed in a department meeting a few weeks back related to growth of gallium nitride, the material in LED light bulbs. It plots a bunch of different outcomes in terms of variables that the experimenters can control, notably the temperature of the substrate and the proportion of gallium and nitrogen being used to grow gallium nitride. I'm not sure it's technically correct in this usage, but colloquially, we refer to diagrams like this as phase spaces. They're basically detailed maps of possible outcomes that you can achieve in terms of variables that you actually have control over. But let's get back to the golf. So two days after the work meeting with the gallium nitride growth phase space diagram, I was back at home on vacation watching the end of the US Open with my parents. And my brain still wired for work was trying to come up with phase space maps of golf putts. If you hit enough putts and put enough points on this chart, is it possible to figure out every pair of speed and angle, every set of initial conditions that will result in making the putt? If you tried to fill out this space space diagram for real, you'd be here all day. So being a bit of a MATLAB addict, I decided to let my CPU do the work and wrote this program. Instead of launching one ball at a time, I can make it try 10 different angles, or 10 different speeds, or a grid of 100. Or if I get really ambitious, a grid of a million golf balls all putt with slightly different starting speeds and angles. We can putt a ball with every conceivable starting condition and record where it goes. It either lands in the hole or it doesn't. Every ball with a different initial condition becomes a pixel in phase space. The white here means that it went in and the black means that it missed. Right now it's just the straight line bullet shots making it in. So let's fast forward a little bit to once the program starts putting more slowly. And we can see that now the angle necessary to make the shot has changed. You have to aim up the hill a bit to get it to break down into the hole. This might be an intuitive result, but you can see it really clearly in phase space. So if there are so many ways to put a golf ball into the hole, why do most players hang out in this area? Why don't we see any straight line bullet shots in real games? Well, in real life you can't always make the putt, and not all misses are created equal. Consider this pixel. It's a miss right next to a hole in phase space, but the ball that made that black pixel is way out here. It's a mile from the pin. If you look at this other black pixel in phase space, it's also a miss right next to a hole. But the ball that made this pixel landed right next to the hole. So this is where you want to be when you miss. So if where the ball lands is so important, let's repeat the experiment. But this time we're going to keep track of the distance between the ball at rest and the pin for every ball that misses. While we're at it, let's upgrade from 225 putts to a million putts and get some higher resolution in phase space. That gives us a new picture of phase space like this, where white is in the hole, red is a miss that landed far from the hole, and blue is a miss that landed very close to the hole. 
anytime you putt the ball, you might mess up. This is one, because it's hard, two, because in physics we always need to account for uncertainty. That means that on any given putt, while you're trying to hit the ball with a very specific speed and a very specific angle, basically aiming for a particular spot in phase space, you may twist slightly and end up over here, or not swing quite hard enough and end up slightly down this way. The shape and size of this uncertainty box is going to vary based on your swing style. But for simplicity, let's just say that it's a rectangle. So you've got a little bit of random noise added to your putt speed and your putt angle with every hit. With our high resolution picture of face space, we start to understand why bullet shots aren't a thing in real golf. If you can't control speed, but somehow have a perfect line, maybe you wanna go for the bullet shot. But if like any real human, you have some uncertainty in both speed and distance when you putt the ball, then aiming somewhere in between the break and the bullet is what you wanna do. Aiming for the perfect breaking shot that would come to rest on the hole if the hole didn't exist is a good option because if you miss, you end up near the hole. That said, acknowledging you've got this little rectangle of face space representing your likely shot and you're only filling part of it with in the hole, you actually maximize your chance of hitting the ball in if you aim just past the hole, hit it a little bit harder. You wanna maximize the white in the hole area inside the little rectangle of face space that you are likely to sample when you putt the ball. The other thing I thought was really interesting was the idea of a dead zone. If you want to get the ball to stop on the other side of this hill, for example, it's physically impossible because if you hit the ball too softly, it doesn't make it over the hill. But if you hit the ball just slightly harder, it gains energy falling down the hill and can't possibly stop until it's way past it. This entire slope is an unreachable area, a dead zone. Turns out this problem is especially bad on the super fast greens at Pinehurst that I can simulate pretty easily by changing a single variable that is effectively green speed. If we want to simulate this dead zone, let's make a big hill, and when we put 10,000 golf balls at it at once, we see that they avoid this spot like the plague. Some go part way up the hill, some have exactly the perfect speed to get stuck on the top of the hill, and all of the balls that make it over the top keep going until they exit the simulation at the far edge. They just can't stop back here no matter what they do. At the risk of this sounding like a number file video, that got me curious to know whether there were any locations on the green that you physically couldn't reach. In the hill example, while you couldn't get the ball to stop in the dead zone, if you'd put the cup in the dead zone, a ball could have landed in it as it rolled through. Interestingly enough, that puts the hole in phase space in the middle of a pocket of red because it's impossible to miss the cup and stop near the hole. Within my admittedly limited simulation, I could not come up with any geometries that completely prohibited you from making the shot, provided that you could putt the ball at an obscenely high speed and go straight towards the hole. If you limited the speed, you could probably come up with some forbidden geometries. Also, shooting the ball like a bullet straight towards the hole is <laughs> easy to simulate if you imagine that everything that touches the hole goes in, but in real life, you're either gonna skip over the hole or with as fast as I was having to simulate it, I don't know, break right through the pin and just keep on going. So these are the things that I didn't bother to try to simulate. That said, I was able to come up with a green in this simulation that has a one-dimensional solution. If you make the green a pyramid and you put the ball at one of the bottom corners of that pyramid, it's possible for the computer to put the ball up the corner of the pyramid and make it to the top. So for any realistic human putting, there's no way the ball wouldn't land on one side or the other and never make it to the cup. The phase space for this green is literally just a single vertical line of success while everything else is far, far away. This is a real green from Thistledew where the cup is actually in a dead zone. You can putt at this all day long, but as long as you're starting from this spot and putting towards that cup, if the ball misses the hole, it's gonna go all the way down the hill. Fast greens like this one can make phase spaces look really weird. In fact, this one, when I simulated it and you know did the, the million golf ball <laughs> phase space, actually has a hook in it. 
at one ball speed, there are two different angles that you can use to make the shot. But if you get an intermediate angle, you'll miss, which is a pretty weird set of events. If we take this to the extreme, I'd call it a bimodal phase space. This is an extremely fast green with an extremely steep hill a ways away from the pin. Unlike when the pin itself is on a slope, now it's almost billiards physics where there's just going to be golf balls reflecting off of that hill. There's no smooth transition from bank shot to straight shot. If you're aiming at the pin, you're aiming at the pin. And if you're aiming up the hill at the pin, then you're aiming up the hill at the pin. If you aim anywhere in between, the ball just sails right on through. What I really love about simulations like this is that once you have the code written, you can just throw all kinds of random nonsense into it. Here I've decreased the friction to zero and made all the balls really heavy, so they orbit the pit like a solar system demo. This is a bunch of spikes that the balls have to try to weave between on their way to the hole. And this is an inverted pyramid with the hole at the bottom. If we throw a million golf balls into it, they kind of slosh around for a while before some finally stop and some finally go in. All that sloshing draws these really bizarre, really complicated swirls in phase space that I think look really cool. Are you ever going to see a green like this in real life and have to contemplate this shot? Probably not. Anyways, I was amused by this for a few days, and I don't know if thinking in phase space is actually going to help your game or not, but hopefully you found it interesting. I really enjoy the thought process behind phase space. If you only have so many variables that are under your control, you have to hope that the outcome that you want to achieve is achievable with some combination of those input variables. And trying to locate that ideal outcome in a phase space that you know nothing about is really the crux of a lot of scientific problems. Golfers get exactly one chance to sample the phase space of a putt in the round because you only putt the ball once, which means you color in a single pixel. <laughs> and However far that lands from the hole is the only data point that you're going to get about that putt. But in the lab, we work on the same problem for months on end. So we're trying to draw a picture of a phase space and we're trying to draw a picture of the same one. It's just that every time we color in a pixel, it's an hours long experiment and we might learn something about this particular spot plotted against all these variables. There are also a whole lot more knobs to turn. Imagine how much more complicated this gets when we go from two variables to control to three variables to control or more. Your phase space that is sort of a flat picture that we were drawing here today turns into a cube in three dimensions where you have three different variables and you're trying to look for the ideal outcome as a volume. And if you had four variables, it'd be like a tesseract and then five variables would be, I don't know, so whatever a cube in five dimensions looks like, some monstrous thing. Highly dimensional phase spaces get really messy in a hurry and it can be very difficult to wander through them in any sort of ordered way until you find the outcome you're looking for. So if you can come up with any everyday systems that can be interestingly represented by a phase space, let me know in the comments below because I'd be very interested to hear about it. And uh, remember to subscribe for more demos, projects, time lapses, and apparently now the occasional MATLAB simulation. Thanks for watching.